just a moment, we'll be reading from <coughs> Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I'll read a couple of sections out of that, that psalm. I guess, Rick, whenever you're ready. Good morning, and welcome to the services of the Central Church of Christ in Hereford, Texas. It's good to have everyone with us live this morning and here in, in the auditorium. Those who are joining us on Facebook and later on YouTube, we're just uh, equally glad to have you and you have your presence uh, as we've come together this morning. We're going to be reading from the book of Psalm, uh, Psalm 51. To uh, begin our thoughts and our worship this morning, and then following that reading, uh, Charles Minshew will lead us in our uh, opening prayer. Psalm 51, I want to read two sections from this psalm. First of all, I want to read the first uh, four verses, and then I want to jump over to verse 10. David writes, and he says, be gracious to me. O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now let's move down to verse 10 and read through verse 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Charles. Father in heaven, we're grateful to you for this day you've given us and the opportunity to come and worship you and study your word. <coughs> Father, we ask that as we go through our trials of, of life that you will always help us to find a solution. Father, we ask that you be with this country as we fight the coronavirus and all the wildfires. Help us to overcome all these problems. Father, we ask you, you to be with us during the election that's coming up. May we look to you for guidance and elect the people that will serve us better through our lives. We thank you for the opportunity to listen to your word today and we ask you to be with us and continue to watch over us and guide us and be with us. We sing praises and worship to you. We ask you to be with Denny and we see bring us blessing. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. First song this morning will be number 778, 778.
shines bright and blessed, he'll prepare us a sun place when we all, when we all get to heaven. One day our day of reposing there will be when we all, when we all see Jesus. We'll It'll be number 922. And to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's turn to 381. 381.
you were in Bible class this morning, there was reference made to idolatry. And after class, Dale and I, in conversation, I made the statement that there's a lot of Christians that wear the cross on a chain, hang it on their wall as a reminder of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice. And at the same time, there are a lot of individuals that use the cross as an idol. This morning, as we gather around the Lord's table, as we've come to know it, to commune with our God, we do so to remember, to be reminded. And when it comes right down to it, what we're reminded of is, in fact, the cross. That Jesus lived and died and went to that cross and suffered for us. So as Christians, I hope that the cross represents a very deep reminder and is not an idol that we place in our pocket or on our wall. Will you pray with me? Our God and our Father, we approach the humbled. Fathers, we gather as the body of Christ, as His church this morning, to commune with Thee. We are reminded. Father, we are reminded that Jesus instituted this memorial, telling His disciples that as often as they would eat and drink, they would proclaim His death until He comes. And Father, this morning we pray that as Your children, we do just that, proclaim His death, remembering, but also understanding that through His death, there is great joy and redemption. Father, we give thanks for this bread. To us as your children, it represents the very body of Jesus Christ, our Lord. A body that was beaten. A body that was physically nailed to the cross. A body that was abused and suffered pain. And Father, as we partake may we understand not only the great price that was paid, but may we understand what was purchased. That through that sacrifice, we have opportunity to stand before Thee, cleansed and made holy through our Lord's sacrifice. And Father, as we partake, may we examine ourselves. May we think soberly and fearfully. As David said, knowing our sins before us. Recognizing that it was our sin that placed him on the cross. And may we partake in a manner that would give thee the proper glory and honor. As you demonstrated your love to us through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Almighty Father, we come to you remembering right now that your son did die and his blood was shed. And because of that, you fulfilled promises that were made and you kept your, your word to mankind that you would not <coughs> turn your back on us, that you would redeem us. And, that, and then, and Father, we remember that now in your, your, that blood that was shed and we remember that we take comfort in the fact that, that you are forevermore willing to forgive our sins. Remember this now as we take this cup. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear God, as we pause this time of our worship service to focus back on all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, we just thank you, Father, for all, for all of these. Father, as we give back a portion of those blessings, we pray, Father, that we would do it with a loving, willing spirit, and that these funds, Father, would be used for your glory and the glory of your kingdom. It's through Jesus we pray.
Good morning again. There are a number of songs I think are especially appropriate that we sing before we observe the Lord's Supper, take of the communion. The one we sang this morning, I think, is maybe one of, one of my favorites for that occasion. And maybe that's particularly because this morning I know what I'm going to talk about, and that last verse particularly struck a chord with me. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Powerful words, powerful message. Give your Bibles, open them to Ephesians chapter 2. While you're turning there, let me say some things of introduction. We're all used to and we're familiar with the uh, fact that in uh, athletics, among other uh, things, we uh, present awards. We give out medals, ribbons, trophies. And people that have those things, that have earned those things, if that's the word to use, they like to put them up on display, don't they? So that when others come around, they can see their trophies. Maybe even their medals and their ribbons that they have won. We kind of like that. You know, recognition of things, accomplishments and deeds. And it's a part of our understanding and of our culture. And it goes all the way back, probably, at least to the original, the ancient Olympic Games, and uh, maybe even further back than that. Don't know. Did you know that God has His trophies too? It may surprise us to think about it, but He does. That's what we're going to look at today. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at the first 10 verses of this chapter. And in doing that, I particularly think the the thoughts, at least as far as the title of the lesson, come out of verse 7. I think you'll see that as we get there in just a moment. But the trophies of His grace, pointing to and thinking about what God has done. We learn about His trophies here. Now, you remember that as we looked at chapter 1 over the past few weeks, we've seen there that Paul writes about and he he thanks God and he praises God for the fact that, that God has what He's done for us, that He has chosen us and He has redeemed us and He has forgiven us and that in Christ we have then an inheritance one that is ours, one that is promised, one that is guaranteed. However, unless we remember and understand where we were before Christ, where we were without Christ, we've we've got to uh, uh, remember that that's where we came from. And that's particularly, I think, why I thought the song or the uh, communion this morning was important. And significant. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. God knew, I should say, I guess. He knew where we were. And that there, in our sin and in our disobedience, we couldn't do anything. So let's look then at these open verses of chapter 2 as it's been divided and see, first of all, our past. Paul's going to discuss our past in these opening verses so that we can better 
appreciate what he's going to do in the verses that follow and, and what God done has done. And he says in verse 1 that in the past, we were dead. He said, and you were, who were dead in your trespasses and sin. Now, obviously Paul's not talking about phys our physical bodies, is he? All of us are still alive. We still are filled with energy. We still breathe in God's air. We take in the nourishment He provides. And, and we're still living physically. He's not talking about a, a physical being dead. He says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He's talking about being spiritually dead. That, that our spirits have been separated from God. The inner man, I guess was a way to put it, is dead. When Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit back in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, Adam's spirit, Eve's spirit, died within them. They immediately were separated from God. Their, their intimate relationship with God that they had enjoyed with Him in the garden from creation through the passage of however much time went on between chapter 2 and chapter 3, that was gone. That relationship, that closeness, that fellowship together. Adam began dying then progressively on the inside as well. And sin continuing to corrupt him and and to further push and separate him away from God. And like him, because of our own individual sins, all of us are dead spiritually. And so Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. In the beginning of verse 2, he says that you were dominated. Now again, remember, we're talking about the past. You were dominated. He says in verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, the average person on the street had, had, had listened to, to this and they'd say, wait a minute, preacher. I'm, a, I, I'm my own person. I make my own decisions. I'm not dominated by anybody, you see, because I can do what I want to do. Whatever I, you know, whatever I please. And he's right to a degree. He can do what he wants to do. It's just that he chooses to disobey God, which means that he's dominated by Satan, by the devil, the one that Paul calls prince of the power of the air. The problem is that, that the average person today and most all people in some ways do not want to do what is right. Satan, the prince of the powers of the air, has gained control over people's hearts and minds and has deceived them into thinking that they are free and fine. When in reality, they are enslaved to sin. They are dominated by Satan and under his control because they choose to follow and to walk and to go in that direction. And so Paul says that we were dead, we were dominated, and then he says that we were disobedient, the rest of verse 2. He said, reading all of verse 2 again, he says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. In the spirit of disobedience, that's mankind's original problem all the way back in the garden. That's what brought, all of, what brought sin into the world, is that man disobeyed God, and man's been disobeying God ever since. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. Dress and keep the garden, 
You can eat in, of any tree in the garden except the one in the very middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of that tree you cannot eat, for the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. And they chose to disobey. They chose against God. And people have been living in rebellion, opposed to God, and disobedience and doing anything but God's will ever since. And then number four, he says in verse three that we were doomed. Verse three says, among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Because we willfully obeyed or disobeyed, even though we knew what was right, we've come under the wrath of God. We've been separated from Him, we are under His wrath. We are guilty without a doubt because we have disobeyed. By our own actions, by our own decisions, we are hell bound. Without hope. Without excuse. Without any way of averting our own awful destiny. Glad I don't get to stop there. Glad that Paul went on writing and reminding the Ephesian brethren and us. Because what we've been talking about and what Paul's written down there in those three verses, that's all bad news. It's all what we have done for ourselves through our own actions. But then Paul goes on. He's written about our past. Now he's going to write about our present. He turns to the good news of what God has done for us to get us back into a relationship with Him, to get us back out of our dilemma of being dead and dominated and disobedient and doomed. And that is what He has done. What God has done. Now notice as we look at this, there's nothing that Paul talks about here that we have done ourselves to accomplish this because what we have done ourselves resulted in the bad news. And we can't ourselves change that. And the first thing he says in verses uh, four and five is that we've been resurrected. Now that's good news because we were dead. Look at verses four and five there. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. When a dead person is brought back to life, I, I know it's not going to happen physically in our day and time, but it did in Jesus' time and it did sometimes in the Old Testament. But when a dead person is brought back to life, it happens to that individual because of grace. Because that dead person can't do anything in and of themselves to bring back life to themselves. Someone else has to do it for them. They can't change the situation they're in. They can, there's nothing they can do to, to go from death back to life. That's why salvation is by grace. 
If God had not provided salvation for man, it simply would not and could not have been done. Because what a dead person needs is life. He needs to get out of that difficult and bad situation of death and be brought back to life. And nothing short of a resurrection, a divine resurrection, is going to solve that problem. Because that's our real problem. We can talk all day about what the problems are that we have, but our real problem is that we're dead in sin without Christ. That's what we need. God must come to our rescue. God must come down and indwell in our spirits. Jesus said, you remember in John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How do dead people spiritually become live again? It's only through the life. It's only through Jesus. He went on to say there in verse 25 that no man comes to the Father except by me. Men and women who are dead in sin desperately need Jesus. And the life that He brings and the life that He gives. Christianity is not... Uh, is not a sick person getting well. It's a dead person receiving life. By the riches of God's grace, you and I are recipients of new life in Christ. We have been raised from the dead spiritually with Christ. Now you remember right at the end of chapter 1, as we closed out looking at it last week, right at the end of chapter 1, Paul had talked about the power that works in us, and he described God's power and those uh, how strong it was, and he uses the words of that we get our words dynamite and energy and great power and is working. And then he talks about the power there uh, Verse 20 of chapter 1, which, brought, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. Well, He's done the same thing for us. He has raised us from the dead, not physically at this point at least, but He has raised us spiritually. And so we have been resurrected from the dead spiritually. We have been given new life in Christ. And then he says in verse 6 that we have been given rest. Given rest. Verse 6 he says, and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now he talked there again, chapter 1, verse 20, about the fact that Christ had been raised from the dead and was now seated at God's right hand. Now he says that we're seated with Him in Christ. Well, what, what does he mean? What, what importance is the idea of being seated? In the Bible, the idea of sitting represents completed work. For example... Turn over in the book of Hebrews to uh, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12 is an example of uh, what we're talking about here. It's the Hebrew writers comparing here the, uh, the work of Christ with the work of the Levitical priest. And he talks about that the Levitical priest just continually were offering the sacrifices over and over and over again. But in chapter 10 here, verses 11 and 12, he says, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. 
But he, speaking of Christ, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Why is he seated at God's right hand? Because he has completed the work of providing salvation for mankind at Calvary. Oh, the grace that drew salvation's man. Oh, the love that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. At Calvary. See, Jesus is seated at God's right hand because there's nothing left for Him to do as far as providing our salvation. He has come in fulfillment of God's plan. He has lived among men. He has lived a perfect life, sinless life among men. And He took that sinless life and He laid it down in our place at the cross of Calvary. And God then on the third day raised Him back up and has now seated Him at His right hand because He's done the job. His redemptive work is done. Now He still pleads for us. He's still our intercessor. He's still working on our behalf. But as far as His redemptive work, He can rest. And Paul declares that we as Christians are now seated with Christ in the heavenly places. In Christ, eternal life is ours. And we are to rest in the one who cried out on the cross. It is finished. He had done God's will. Executed God's plan in His own execution. By the grace of God, our salvation was secured by Christ and we now rest in Him on the basis of what He did. Well, Paul's not through here. With our salvation completed then, we become God's trophies. Verse 7, Ephesians chapter 2. He just said that we have been seated with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that, that means this is why. This is, there's the because. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In the coming ages, that is eternity future, angels, think about this a minute and see if it doesn't just strike you and, and fill you with, with confidence and, and power and assurance. Angels will stand in awe of our holy God in the fact that He could find a way to bring sinful, rebellious, disobedient, doomed, men into a relationship with Him. Revelation chapter 7. I've already put it up there on the screen, but let's read those verses. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. John is seeing this vision of, of the, God's throne room. And he sees the Lamb who's worthy to open the book that's in God's right hand and to and to break the seals that's in chapter 5. But in chapter 7, he has this vision of, of heaven filled with all the redeemed, the, 
what, what he's calls in verses 4 through, through 8, 144,000. That's, you know, that's not a literal number. That's just talking about the, the, the vastness and the significance and the perfection of the number of God's people. But now look at verses 9 through 12. After these things, John says, I looked. Behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches out with a loud voice saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying Amen Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Do you ever have a day? And this is a rhetorical question because I know you do. Do you ever have a day when you just sit back and you think, man, such a failure today. So many things I wanted to do didn't get done. And so many things I did want to do that, that I did. And that's just, it's just been a waste. And you wonder... I, I don't know if I can even sneak in the back door of it. But when you have one of those days next time, remember what Paul just wrote, we just read here in Ephesians 2 and verse 7. And what John wrote in Revelation 7 verses 9 to 12. And to remember, you know, rethink what we're looking at here. God, one day, God is not going to sneak you in the back door of heaven, but He's going to open wide the gates of heaven and He's going to march you in, into heaven, through the front gate, because you will be one of His greatest trophies. God has provided for us in Christ. So what's His plan? If, if we're going to bring glory to God, then He must have a plan whereby we're going to accomplish that, whereby our salvation can be accomplished and that will enable Him to, to bring us in. And there won't be any boasting on our part. Well, look at verses 8 and 9 back here in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says there, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. What does it mean to be saved by grace? Well, it just simply means that God didn't have to save us. God didn't have to save anyone. He could have allowed us to all deal with and suffer and die and go to hell as a consequence of our own disobedience and he would have still remained holy 
holy, holy, holy. He could have done that. He could have. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. See, Jesus came because God loves us, because Jesus loves us, and God freely chose to do for us what He was not obligated to do. He told Adam and Eve, and the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Paul tells us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin, that is the consequences, the result of sin is death. And it could have ended there. It could have been a period at the end of that sentence and that was it. But there's not. Because Paul goes on to say, the wages of sin and death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God provided that resurrection for us. Grace is the result of God's freely deciding to do for man what man could not do for himself. The only requirement, if that's what you want to call it. And that is a response of faith. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. That's the way we respond to God's grace. That's the way we accept His grace. And accepting God's salvation plan Believing that when we do so, when we respond in in acceptance of it, in obedience to that plan, then God's going to forgive us and He's going to give us new life. Well, what is His plan? How do we, through faith, accept what He's done? Same way today that it was on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. First time that, that the gospel is preached to the masses. Acts 2 verse 38, you remember what Peter says there. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you. Doesn't leave any, I mean, that, that doesn't miss anybody, does it? Repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's plan was forged by His grace alone, before He created man, before He created the world, God's plan becomes a reality in our lives when we follow it with faith. Trusting God. Trusting what He said. Trusting what He's accomplished in Christ. And His promise. When he forgives, he forgets. That we're washed and made white as snow. Well, what's his purpose in all this? <laughs> While we await a time where he, that we will be brought into heaven and, and, and be displayed as trophies of God's grace, what are we supposed to be doing in the meantime? Well, that's verse 10. Paul says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are His workmanship. We're not saved by good works. No, don't misunderstand what, what Paul's saying there. It's not... By our works that we're saved, he says that we are saved for, to do 
to carry out good works and in those good works to point people to Jesus. Point them to God. To God's grace. Church attendance. Weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. Following the Ten Commandments. Being a good neighbor. Leading a moral, respectable life. Those are all things that that we need to do, but those things will not get us into heaven. But we are to do good deeds. In fact, verse 10 teaches us that God saved us by grace in order that we do those things. Again, notice these verses. First time he's brought up about anything for that we need to do, but it's after salvation. God did all the work. God planned the plan, sent Jesus, raised Jesus from the dead, all on our behalf, all for us, all things that we could not do for ourselves. And in response in faith, We work not for salvation, but because of salvation. Now Paul's going to get to those things about those works in chapters 4, 5, and 6. And we'll talk about those as we we progress through Ephesians and get there. Those good works that we need need to be doing. And these are are, are things that will set us apart from from the walking dead that we see in our community and in our world. God doesn't give us new life so that we uh, can live however we please. Because that's still being disobedient. That's still being dominated by the prince of the, of the air, a prince of this world. God gives us new life so that we bring glory to Him. And that's why He chose us in Christ to be trophies of His grace. Ultimately, everyone is going to be somebody's trophy. We're either going to be trophies of God's grace or if we persist in rebellion against Him and leave this life dead in sin, then we'll spend eternity in hell as a trophy of the wiles of Satan. In contrast, the one who responds in faith to Calvary becomes an eternal Trophy of God's saving grace. And it just simply boils down to that. Boils down to this. Whose whose trophy are you going to be? Whose will are you going to do? God by His grace and His love and His mercy, has provided the only opportunity, the only way that we can be resurrected from the dead spiritually and that we can overcome the dominance of Satan and we can be obedient and no longer be doomed. He tells us all about it right here. There's something we can do to help you this morning to walk in the grace of God through faith in Jesus, trusting, doing His will. And please make that known by coming as we stand and we sing.
explanation of the hope of the plan that God has laid forth for us and the hope that we have if we're in Christ. Good to see everyone that's able to be with us this morning and pray that you'll remain safe throughout the week and be able to return the next time we meet. Our closing song this morning is number 881. 881, following this song, James Self will lead us in a closing prayer. Number 881. <clears throat> I'm satisfied with just Christ below, a little silver and a little gold. City where the ransom will shine. I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow. Our Holy Father, we continue to give you thanks for these opportunities that we have to come and meet as Christian people. We're thankful during this time, Lord, that uh, we can share our, our services with those uh, electronically who are unable to be with us, and we are very grateful for that opportunity. That was a powerful lesson we heard this morning, Father, and we thank Denny for delivering it. We thank you for the uh, simplicity of the word in which he got it from. We pray, Father, we'll keep these things in mind as we go about our task this week of living a daily life pleasing to you. We pray, Father, that we'll remember the great commandments that you gave us, that we shall love you with all of our heart, our soul, and with all of our mind, and that we will love our neighbor as ourselves. And keep it in mind that the second part of this, we demonstrate this love for our neighbors by doing no harm to our neighbors. If we could follow these things, Lord, the world would be much simpler. We would have much fewer problems than uh, what we see existing today. Thank you, dear God, for all the ways you continue to bless us. Please look down upon us with your mercy and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.